What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. All right, so before I get into this video, I want to give a shout out to Bloodprint for showing love to the channel, uh, coming through with a $20 donation via the Cash App. Um, you know what I'm saying? He, he's he's a, a good brother. Uh, you know, I've, I've known him for a long time. I'm very insightful. Um, very intelligent, very cerebral, the way he looks at things, and, and he's a good dude, you know what I'm saying? And once again, I, I, I really do appreciate you showing love in the cash app. So, anybody else that wants to show love uh, to this channel, you can do so in the links in the description box below. Um, I also have a Patreon where I upload videos as well. Uh, on the Patreon, I, I talk about subjects that I can't really talk about on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? This ain't really our house, uh, our house like that, you know what I mean? Uh, so I talk about stuff that's not safe for YouTube on the Patreon. And it's only $2 per month, and there's already, oh man, 400, I think 400 some videos up there. You know, it's been a minute since I counted. The last time I counted was 360 something, but that was a, a couple of months ago. So it has to be over 400 videos now on the Patreon. So let's talk about this game, all right? Game three between the Los Angeles Clippers and the Utah Jazz. And uh, this was a must win for the Clippers, all right? Not just, in my opinion, for the series, but them losing this game would have had major implications down the line as far as the future of this team, you know? And the perception of not just this particular team, but of the franchise. We must remember that in the 50-year history of the Clippers, back when they were in you know, San Diego and before when they were in Buffalo, when they were the Braves, the Buffalo Braves, they've never been out of the second round of playoffs. Never. And when you look at the history of the Boston Red Sox, and how they supposedly are cursed, right? Or were cursed. They got over that hump back in 2004 when they came back from that historic 0-3 deficit to beat the Yankees and win the World Series. That got that monkey off their back. And what did you see? You saw them win a series. Uh, pardon the pun, but you saw them, see a, you saw them win a, a series of World Series. Um, the Chicago Cubs. Hadn't won a World Series since 1908. Hadn't appeared in one since 1945. And, you know, and the GOAT and uh, Bartman and, and all of these curses and blown late, uh, you know, season leads as far as making the playoffs, you know, just choke playoff moments. They were seen as cursed until they finally won it all in 2016 against the a, a, a team that was seen as slightly less cursed in uh, the uh, Cleveland Indians. So, and now people don't look at that anymore. It doesn't matter because they've gotten over that hump. The Clippers need to get over that hump. Okay? And if they're going to do it, they need to do it now. Um, and they're in the right direction because they won game three, 132 to 106. All right? Uh, Paul George was the X factor in this game. All right? Kawhi Leonard, I believe, led the team in points, but it was it was Paul George that was the difference in this ball game. All right, Paul George uh, came in big with 31 points, three rebounds, and five assists. Um, what's interesting to note is that those numbers would have been an average day, actually a slightly below average day for Paul George when he was going through that great streak playing. In Oklahoma, uh, I think it was two years ago. During that season, he averaged about 28 points, maybe seven rebounds, and I think four assists or something to that extent, or three and a half assists. But there was a stretch when Paul George was an MVP caliber candidate. There was a stretch, there was a three-month stretch where he averaged uh, 33 points, eight rebounds, four assists, and he was playing on a high level on both the offensive and defensive end. I remember Paul George. People got to remember, man. That season, until he got hurt, 
Paul George was a guy who was known for not being clutch. This guy was having 47 point triple double, uh, 39 point triple double. Uh, this guy was scoring like uh, 27 points in like 12 minutes and hitting game winners left and right. I mean, uh, Paul George is almost like, um, you know, Paul George is, is this extraordinarily streaky guy. Um, when he has it going, he looks like a top four or five player in the NBA. Maybe even higher than that at times. But then there are games where he disappears. And the nerves are getting to him, obviously. The, the situation is getting to him. I don't know if he loses focus. I don't know what it is. But Paul George can look like he hasn't shot a basketball in six months. But he came through. Uh, Kawhi Leonard led all scorers with, I believe, 34 points. Let's look at that again. Yeah. 34 points with 12 rebounds and 5 assists. Nicholas Patoon had 17 points, 7 rebounds, and 2 assists. Reggie Jackson had 17 points. And uh, for the Utah Jazz, Donovan Mitchell had 30 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists. Joel Ingles, 19. Jordan Clarkson, 14. Rudy Gobert, 12 points and 10 rebounds. Bogdanovich, just 9 points in 36 minutes of play. So what did the Clippers do look differently this time? But well, they did a much better job of making life difficult for Donovan Mitchell, all right? It's kind of surprising that when you look at the all-time points-per-game average scoring list in playoff history, minimum 25 appearances in the playoffs, Donovan Mitchell, I believe, was something like six all-time in scoring average. Uh, I think that's about right. Number one is Michael Jordan, 33.4. Number two is Allen Iverson, 29.7. Number three, I believe, is Kevin Durant, 29 point. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I think Jerry West is number three, 29.2. I think Kevin Durant is right there at 29.1. Um, LeBron is, I think, fifth at 28.7. And then six is Donovan Mitchell, 28.4. That sounds shocking. Uh, and he uh, added to that with a 30-point performance. But I have to say this, though. When you look at his last two seasons, Donovan Mitchell, he's gone up against teams that were not necessarily noted for their defensive prowess. Denver Nuggets, uh, you know, Clippers are known as a good defensive team. However, um, you know, they haven't at times played great defensively. And that could, that could be because of, you know, lack of communication out there, but a lot of it's just bad scheming by the coach, right? Uh, I think the first round, who they played? Grizzlies, I think it was. Uh, they weren't. They aren't. They weren't noted for being a great defensive team. Um, when they were doubling and trapping Donovan Mitchell instead of just single coverage, which is what he's used to, it makes him have to give up the basketball. And uh, when you have a player who isn't getting you know, what he's normally accustomed to getting out there offensively, oftentimes, especially with a younger guy like Donovan Mitchell, he doesn't let the game come to him. He tries to force the issue. And what you saw was a guy who was jacking up what could have been potentially bad shots. Now, a lot of them did go in. He scored 30 points. But the key is he had to work a lot harder for those 30 points. And he wasn't killing you for 45 or 50 points. 
So my brother took a TV, excellent uh, basketball analysis. He put out the blueprint. You double him. You keep a guy on my collar because he can he can light you up too. You can't not double him. I mean, not have a guy on him. You let the other two weaker uh, offensive players do uh, try to beat you. That's Joe Ingles and Jordan, Clark, uh, Jordan Clarkson. I think Clarkson had 14. Joe Ingles had 19. That's within the realm of comfortability if you're a Clipper fan or if you are the Clippers. You can live with that. What you don't want is Donovan Mitchell getting an easy 40-plus points or, you know, Michael Conley potentially going off and getting a 30-point uh, performance as well, then that makes it much more difficult. Okay, the other guys are a little bit more predictable. All right? Um, the Clippers did a much better job defensively as a team. And it really doesn't make any sense when you look at when you look at the Clippers roster and you look who's on there. This should be a really good defensive team. They should. They should be, <clears throat> in my opinion, the Clippers should already be in a position where they're preparing for the Western Conference Finals. It's this schizophrenic tendency of this team when they're not at home or not even just that. Well, I shouldn't even say that because last series was, was the opposite of that. When they're in a position where they get too comfortable and too lax, then they just don't play Clippers basketball. You know what I'm saying? Um, they, there's no sense of urgency with this team. They're sleepwalking out there sometimes. It's like they're thinking about their taxes or, you know, fantasizing about, you know, sucking Zoe Saldana's pussy or what does that mean? What does this mean? But anyway, you know, it's like they're not focused on basketball out there. And they keep letting teams back into series. Now, hopefully, you know, if you're a Clipper fan, that doesn't happen again. But I have this feeling like they're going to have another letdown game and let Utah win a game that they shouldn't win and, and, and have to unnecessarily play another game seven. Now, Donovan Mitchell, I think, hurt his ankle. I think it was midway through the fourth quarter. Uh, I don't think he's going to miss game, uh, what would it be, game five? I don't think he's going to miss, no, it's got to be game four. I don't think he's going to miss game four. Uh, you know, essentially with him not being in the lineup would essentially be a victory for the Clippers. So, you know, from what I can tell, I don't think it's that serious. But we'll see. But, yeah, big victory for the Clippers, man. And, uh, you know, tell me what you guys think.